Well, guys, we're only two episodes in, and already the show has stumped me. Hey, guys, Kevin Ryan for the second half of the premiere of Mr. Robot, se of the season premiere of Mr. Robot Season 2. This, of course, was part two of the uh, season premiere on Mask, uh... At unmasked dot uh, tc. Now I was definitely looking forward to this premiere. Obviously, I already reviewed the first half, uh, which you guys can check out. I already reviewed the first half and everything, and uh, I was going to review both as a whole, but I just felt it worked better this way. And uh, here's the thing with part two: the part one didn't have part two. I thought was I'm not going to say it was better or worse because really I just see it as one big episode. This just felt more complete. Character that we didn't see in the first part, we saw here, and I understood why they had to do this in the two separate parts. There was a lot to unpack in this premiere. A lot of people to introduce, a lot of people to meet, and I think overall they really use this this to their advantage, definitely. But let's just get into this episode because a lot happened this episode, probably a lot more than the first part. The first part was a lot of building stuff, and this episode, a lot really went down. A lot really happened here, and already we have quite, you know, quite a doozy at the end of uh, at the end of this episode, which I'll get into. But let's get to the beginning of this episode because such a well done first scene. We see Scott shows up to the F Society to deliver the payment uh, that he asked someone from, and basically, you know, because he agreed that he deliver the payments and everything, and. Throughout this whole entire scene, Phil Collins uh, Take Me Home is playing in the background, which I thought was a very good choice because it's kind of like take uh, Phil Collins is kind of singing, is kind of like uh, singing to Scott. Like he's kind of everything that Scott's thing in his head is coming out, which I thought was really cool. I really like the way that was done. But uh, basically, he asked someone from Evil Corp on a phone if he found anything. He says nothing yet. A man then approaches him. He stares at him, and the man looks very disgruntled, almost like he doesn't want him to be there. And he stares him down then walks away. Who the hell this man is, I don't know. But Scott asks the man who the guy was. He says he's closing and they're coming. And Scott says to wait. He says he's a client. Scott says to wait. The guy comes back and asks if he's from Evil Corp. He asks who he is. He says he's just making a delivery. He tells him to sign the papers. Scott does so. The biker then gives him an F Society mask. And the man says to grab the biker. Scott says they haven't picked up the money yet. And Scott looks at the mask. And uh, you can just see, you know, he actually picks up an F Society mask. And uh, he looks at this mask not really knowing if he should actually put it on you know he's really wondering is this right should i really put this on I, and one of the big messages i think of this scene is should we just do what everyone tells us to do or should we be our own individual person or, or own individual self and not give in to temptation and i think that's a big part of this scene is the way that scott really is complaining should i give in or should i just you know not do what they tell me to do and the man says they don't recommend he do that he says the unit search at first, and uh, but then he gets a call from F Society. This is when things get a lot more personal because F Society tells him he has 10 seconds to do his ask, or every bank that's part of Evil Corp will be bricked. Literally, ever. And if you don't know what brick means, it means they're not going to work anymore. They're going to hack into them, they won't work anymore, and it just makes things worse for Scott. As we know, Evil Corp is already hacked and things are already not going well, but Scott gets off the phone. The man asks who the caller was. Scott puts on the mask, does what they told him to do, which is to throw all of the money in the streets and set it on fire, showing really money means nothing to F Society. You know, they really don't feel money means much of anything. And people have said that, that nowadays money doesn't mean much because people are just naturally rich. And people who have been rich, you know, they'll always have this money. And to F Society, to, uh, you know, Evil Corp, money doesn't mean much of anything. And to F Society, they're just trying to show that money really doesn't matter to them, definitely, which I think is definitely a very interesting scene. Uh, he, anyone, no one in Evil Corp notices this, which everyone takes pictures, and Darlene watches this all go down among the crowd. Such a cool choice, the way we saw Darlene watching this, and returns to the building that F Society is staying in, and that's the only scene we see of Darlene in this part of the premiere. We already saw her in the first part, and that's something I did like, because that character we saw in the first part, they've had their time, we've seen them there, we don't need to see him again in this episode, we don't see Darlene anymore in this episode, but such a well done first scene, such a great start this episode, and already things were just awesome. I mean, this is what Mr. Robot does best is scenes like this. There isn't many, there aren't many shows on TV that can execute this scene as well as Mr. Robot did. Absolutely love that, and I think just a perfect way to start things off. So we then see Philip. He's in a boardroom with the government. They talk about how they're not saying any more money with, to the feds and hacks and asks um, how they burn th through that kind of money in 30 days anyway. Because as we know, they've given him this money. You know, he's given them money. And I, what I really like about this scene is that one, 
Philip is now a main character, so they can do a lot more with him, but it also shows that Philip as well has people he's working for. Even though he's the head of this huge corporation, he has people he's working for, and uh, he's not, you know, the mo he's not the, uh, you know, he, he really is not the one in charge, but you do see that he thinks he is the one in charge, and Michael Christopher, I think, just does such a good job playing these egotistical type manipulators, and that's something that Philip does so well in the scene. Philip says that he has a point there, he says he's talking about what's on his face. The head of the government Jack says that they've already given them a burst of cash. They can't give them any more. Philip says they sold the T-bills to the Chinese and that money in return will be used as a loan for their company. He says the real recovery program is months from being done. And the woman Mary says that the public is hoarding cash. The housing market, if grinding to a halt, the big three is desperate for cash. Everyone in the commission needs to do the results within the next three days before they can do anything else. And Philip says rebuilding the, their database is the only solution to this problem. This is not his opinion. These are the facts. And he knows that. And he says he's cooperating with them on every level, even if the FBI working out his offices, and he begs and pleads some more. Jack says he's got to resign. They have no other options, and the president cannot go to Congress with a bailout right now. You know, they need this money. And Philip talks about the Great Depression and what FDR did with the New Deal, and he actually tries to make it seem like what FDR did did nothing, and that it was fake. And in many ways, he's not wrong that the New Deal didn't really do much in terms of the Great Depression. Yes, I will admit that. But still, just the way that he's trying to appease to them, make it seem like, oh, he did nothing, you know, nothing happened with the with the New Deal or anything. I just thought it was really interesting the way he did that, and uh, he tries to relate it into what's going on now. He says his reports were mostly lies, and nevertheless, it worked because the, the public believed that the government had everything under control. And he tells them that this is the great business. They can always con people into believing in something where it's the American dream, or family values could be freedom fries for all he cares. It doesn't matter as long as the cons work, and people buy, sell, whatever it is they want them to. He says if he resigns, then any scrap of confidence the public is already clinging on to will be destroyed, and they all know a con doesn't work without the confidence. He says this is the, and honestly, I get what he's saying, you know, they need confidence, and Philip definitely has said confidence, and he says this is the best idea they could come up with for a win, then he shouldn't be the one resigning. He says he has to head back to New York, and they should let him when they've locked up the votes, and again, it just shows even though he's with all of these different, you know, uh, bankers, and he's with the guy government, he still seems to have power over them. That's something that just Philip seems to just inexplicably have. He just, he's always going to be more powerful. He's always going to be this very, this guy that's driven by power, and you definitely do see that here. And I really am loving what Michael Christopher is doing. I'm very happy to become main character because we didn't get this from last season. Well, we did get this from last season. We saw, of course, how much he was able to appease Angela into what she's doing. But you can always tell that no matter what Philip is doing, he always makes sure that one, he's always on the up and up, and two, he always gets done what he needs to get done. That's how he always works. If he wants something done, it's going to get done. He will do whatever he can to get that person to listen to him, and you definitely do see that here, which I thought was very well done. I definitely really did love that. And speaking of uh, characters that were upgraded, we then see Joanna, who is also upgraded this season, and already she's having a lot more to do than she did last season, because she's with a man who's giving her, like, really hardcore BDSM, like, I felt like I was watching, like, Fifty Shades of Grey or something, it was really weird, and we then meet our new character, uh, Agent Dom D. Piero, played by Grace Gummer, who, yes, that is Meryl Streep's daughter, which I'm glad that she finally has a steady show, because I've seen her on so many shows and so many different things, and it seems like anything that she goes on this is a steady show it gets canceled i mean she was on smash one time she was on american horror story freak show everything she goes on is only limited if she but this show knowing mr robot i mean she could be on here for a while or she could get killed off this season i honestly don't know Either way, I really love her character. She's ordering lunch, talks to the clerk about his wife, and she asks how she, he, she's doing these days. He says her daughter's sick. Dom asks which one she is. He says the Sally, the young one. She asks if that's traditionally an Iranian name. The man in front of her tells her to hurry up, and she jokes around she should play before she gets lynched. Then she buys a lollipop. Goes back to the station, told someone's waiting for them, and it's none other than Gideon who's waiting for them. We realize that this is the woman who is after Gideon, you know, she's the one that's coming after him, and we don't know what he said, because after that we cut to Elliot here, but I thought it was a very good introduction, we don't know a ton about Agent D. Piero right now, but I like what we got of her, I think she did a very good job, and I think it's enough for me right now to say I really am liking her character, I'm looking forward to seeing what definitely she's gonna do as the season goes on, especially because what happens at the end of this episode, I don't really know what else she's gonna do here, but we'll talk about that. So Elliot then asks, if we look closely at the scenes between Aura and Chaos, do we see the same thing? 
thing. He does the strain, the terror, the glimpses of truth hidden underneath it, or is it that they become who they are when they put on their mask? And he has a point, definitely, that every character we see in this episode somehow feels like they've kind of corrupted themselves with power, or that they've seemingly just, uh, you know, gotten themselves into, you know, they're, they've, they're corrupted with power, or they're corrupted by what people have told them to do, and or they're hypnotized into something, and he asks sometimes, he wonders, what we hide behind, what mask we wear, or are we just afraid as the rest of them? And the questions, again, he asked are just so genius. That's something I love about Mr. Robas. The questions that Elliot asks aren't, you know, he, he definitely is a point here. And he says that he's not afraid, he's different. He watches basketball with Leon, who gets into a fight with one of the players who says they need the ball. Leon holds on to it, throws across the street, tells him to get their own ball, and the player asks what his problem is. He asks what he is, and before Bright breaks out, uh, we meet Elliot's neighbor, Ray, played by Craig Robinson, actually the person I was most looking forward to seeing, because I remember Craig Robinson months ago got a deal on Mr. Robot, and I'm like, I don't know if the show's really gonna work for him, but he really did some great work in this episode. I really love what we saw Craig Robinson in this episode. I think he did a very good job, and I like they didn't introduce him till the second half, because it, it ties into one of the most interesting aspects of this episode, which I'll definitely get into. So, Ray goes to Leon, says they're all just here to have a good time. Leon agrees, but not before leaving, and Ray is one of the few characters on the show that seems to have just amount this extreme amount of positivity even though his life you can tell isn't the best he is extremely positive he lives every day to the fullest and that's something that we haven't really seen with you know with characters like Ray you know every character in the show they're either like really depressed or they're going through something and Ray's not like that Ray has this just really good amount of positivity and it's not really something we've seen before and I like seeing that and I like the positive energy that he brings to the show definitely and he was funny definitely Craig Robinson's a funny dude and he definitely was funny here so basically he sits down with his dog Maxine sees Elliot who says Maxine has been acting a little off lately but she really perked up when she saw him and he asks if he's a dog person and Elliot says that he used to have one Ray asks what happened to her and we find out the flipper the dog that he had died flipper's dead and now I'm assuming the flipper's dead because all he says is he doesn't have her anymore and Ray recognizes his name, introduces himself, and says he's seen him before, and says he must like the games. He tells him to look at Bradstreet, who's good on the board. He tells him to look at these guys, and all sees a lot of care and effort into what is really just a pretty shitty game. And the fact that they still put effort into it, you know, really astounds him, which... The questions that he talks about, the things that he says, he's really not wrong with, and I did like seeing that. He's, and basically, he says, all Maxine sees is a bunch of dumb animals and can't think past anything and get the ball into the hoop. And what they want them, and what they want the, the, them to see is his, his badass homies ready to kill. If they stick to them, question is, which is, if they stick to the question, which is the truth. Maybe all of them, maybe none of them, maybe truth is all that exists and what they think is all they got. And he sees that why he's jealous of Maxine, because all she sees is give is uh, to give a shit about his eating and sleeping and Elliot says that and Elliot says um, nothing and Ray says that he's not the loquacious type but he talks all the time he guesses he picked up on that it's a cool communication is good for his line of work and it takes them a lot to run a business and he says a man like him who works with computers he gets as much as Maxine gets E.E. E. Cummings and you realize that he's involved in computers too which is the one thing that Elliot doesn't want he again he wants to kind of stray away from this and he says when he's heard and Elliot says whatever he's heard it's not true he doesn't do it anymore and he's straight away and remember he wants to stick to the regiment he wants to stick to it he's very he you know he's very uh big about sticking to it and he's gonna do whatever he can to stick to that and uh mr robot tells him to try to help him once they get, let that old feeling come back and ray says when he is at breakfast his wife told him he'd make a friend today not many talk to him around here except for the players he asks if it's okay if they continue talking elliot says no thanks ray says that it's cold brutal shit he'll have to listen to adele on repeat when he gets home he says he can take a hint and leaves and mr robot asks how long he's gonna keep doing this analog nightmare and elliot says uh, to us as long as it takes without his weapon of choice Mr. Robin is unplugged, powerless, so try to wear him down as long as we stick to the regimen. He can't take control, no matter how much of illusion he thinks this all is, because remember, Mr. Robot says that the regimen is all an illusion, that he's really not seeing the bigger picture, and we see, and I thought it was such a well-done scene, love the way that's done, and really sets us up, like I said, for what ends up being one of the most interesting plot points of this episode. So we then see Nancy Grace on TV speaking about the 5-9 attack and how Tyrell is the one behind this all, and 
I like that this was all about Tyrell because then we see Joanna, who I'm assuming this is her boyfriend, Derek, who says that Vanderpump is on and asks if she wants to watch. And just like uh, Philip, just the power that Johanna has over him, you know, she's just in a bathtub this entire scene. You can just tell she has power over him, though. She says another time he asked how he was this that time. Did he do okay and not hurt her too bad? She says he's spoiling again. He asks if she wants a drink in the bar. He knows the guy that works there want makes awesome cocktails. She says they're not to be seen together. That was their agreement. Someone that knocks at the door, he says that's him, isn't it? Says it freaks him out, asks why he can't wait downstairs. Joanna says he's doing his job. He opens the door, and a man named Jesse tells Derek to go since they can't leave together. And I don't know who this guy is, really, but clearly he's an FBI agent that's supposed to be there, I guess, for what's going on. But very well done scene. Really like the way this is done. There's a lot of uncertainty going on with Joanna, and that's not the last thing we get with her, which I'll get into that in a little bit. But then we see Angela, who... Out of all the characters, I think Angela is really the one that's changed the most. Because Angela, as we know, you know, she was little, innocent Angelo, hung out with Elliot in his childhood days, suspected that someone was going on with him. And of course, she was trying to, you know, stop whatever happened with Terry Colby and stop what he did to her and everything. But this is not the same Angela we saw last year. This Angela is a lot more corrupted with power, a lot more just uh, forward, and just a lot more, I'd say, powerful. And she's also a lot more. Uh, direct and very blunt and I like seeing the side of Angela I honestly think it's really interesting and she's now the PR manager she's at Evil Corp talking with another worker the woman says that they don't want CNBC or Fox News and Angela calls as if it's a done deal the guy on the phone says either Scott gives the money or not and she says they're going with CNBC they're sending 5k to them as they speak and she knows she'd rather go with Bloomberg TV he's got to twist their arm and he says bullshit she hangs up the woman asks if she just hung up on Bloomberg and asks if she's trying to get fired and Angela tells her to leave the woman says when Melissa finds out Angela says to go get to get her go ahead and tells her whatever she wants now she's get she's got in her fucking cubicle and the woman walks away again you can tell the woman's kind of scared of her but at the same time she's breaking the rules like Angela's clearly just like Philip doing whatever the hell she wants to so Angela puts on on her headphones and listens to Sonic's use bull in the heather and again it just shows the power she has over everyone the way she's just draining everyone out with her music and the way she's just kind of doing what she wants and focusing strictly on her work and as she gets the call back from Foster who says they'll take it off and they're talking about the bailout and Pluff's suicide and Angela says she can't do Pluff and set and remember that was a guy that committed suicide on national TV it's out of respect for his family since she's doing him a favor he doesn't want to talk about he doesn't want to ask about that and Foster says it's been a month she says one question she has to approve it and the woman comes back with Melissa Angela says Bloomberg TV agreed to all the points exclusive Foster is sending her the DM memo. She says she needs to get coffee before the next staff meeting and just such a well done scene. Just seeing how much Angela's changed. I, there were so many good things that scene has shown. What, how Angela's changed, how powerful she's become and how I really think she's going this direction of less of a hero and more of an anti-hero. And honestly, I really like it. I think Angela honestly could end up being our villain of the season and I think we definitely are starting to see that here, which is a very unexpected direction, but I think kind of an expected one as well. I mean, when she was out of the position in Evil Corp, you knew it was going to mess with her mind. You knew it was going to do something to her, and it really has. It's made her more powerful than ever. It's made her stronger, and I, you know she's going to down spiral at some point. You know definitely she's going to have her downfall. You kind of get the sense that this isn't going to be how things are forever, and things aren't going to be the way that they are right now. Things are going to get bad for her. Things she is going to down spiral. I'm looking forward to seeing when that's going to happen. Definitely, I think the most interesting direction in this episode is what they did with Angela. We get a little more with her a little bit later, but I just thought this was a very unexpected but surprising direction, but also a very welcome one and something I definitely really do like for a character because I always liked Angela. I just think this gives her a lot more to do and makes her overall a lot more interesting. I think we're really moving into that uh, anti-hero unexpected spot that I really am looking forward to seeing what they do with. So Joanna's then with her baby, and she finds this gift on her door, and you don't know who it's from. She opens it up, finds a box, which has another box inside of it, and it's Tyrell's phone. So this kind of makes us think that maybe Tyrell's dead, and he gave her this before he died, which she contemplates what to do with, because obviously his phone is right there. She's not just going to hack into it, but she doesn't really know what to do with it either. So I like seeing Joanna actually kind of confused and not knowing what to do, because Angela's always someone that has plans and makes plans, and for once, she has no control over this. And I really did like seeing that. I thought that definitely was interesting. Angela's then at a bar, meets with Anna Tara, who apologized for being late coming to the city because it was so hot in the 90s. Angela says she's decided to stay, 
and Anatar asked when they were going to discuss this, but Anatar's already made the decision. No, there is no discussion. She's already made this. She knows she's staying, and Anatar can't say anything about it. And she says they have for these. You know, they asked when they were going to discuss this, and she says they have for several weeks now. Anatar reminds her that she's the one who gave her this job offer in the first place, and even when she convinced her to see where it would lead, they agreed that it would be a brief trial basis. And Angela says that they were both clearly wrong about their motives, and Anatar says she's being naive. Angela says they don't need to have these talks anymore. She likes her job, she's not quitting, and that's her decision. That's what she's going to do. And Antar says she never had any intention of leaving. Angela says she knows she thinks they're pulling something, but it's because she couldn't imagine anyone else ever valuing her as a real asset, when the truth is she's done more for her in a lawsuit than she's ever done for her or herself. And she is valuing even though she doesn't see it, they do. And Antar says that to her, they're just barbarians in $10 suits, but she sees it as a law, and she wouldn't want to cut her losses, and she says again, she tells her this story, which I thought was very interesting, about how this guy wor walks up to a, works up to a woman at the bar, he makes small talk, but she says she isn't going to go home, the guy says, what if you offered her a million dollars to sleep with her, the girl's never had a million dollars in her life, she stops and thinks about it. the guy changes his mind, says what if he changes his mind to a dollar instead, the woman asks what kind of woman he thinks she is, he says they've already figured it out, now they're just negotiating, and interesting i mean it kind of i think what she's trying to say is that e evil corp has gone into her head they're making her think that she's a certain way she's not actually that way but she's now become that way and that's something that anatar doesn't realize and she walks away and angela you can tell is really thinking back at what she just told her but then this really confirms how far gone angela's gone because a man comes up to her asks if she's alone she literally sleeps with this guy and she gets up in the middle of the night sits down puts on a video about success and money she says she's confident or confidence it's one of those videos where like they tell you to say things, but she says she's calm and her confidence is powerful. She says she recognizes herself as exceptional, and she will follow her dreams no matter what, and just such a well-done scene. I love this transformation of Angela. I love seeing this darker side of her, and I'm really looking forward to exploring it as the season goes on. Clearly, she's, you know, just gaining so much control, and she doesn't really know what to do with it. That's kind of how I saw it, at least. I mean, yeah, she's using it to her advantage, but she also doesn't really know exactly what to do with it, and I really am looking forward to seeing what she ends up doing with this, where this ends up taking her, because there are so many places she could go. We're looking forward to seeing that's going. I think overall that's going to be one of the most interesting directions uh, for the rest of the season. So Elliot, Leon, and Ray are watching the game again. Ray says that Maxine wants to come over and say hello because she missed him. He thinks the damn dog might actually like him more than she does, and uh, more than she does Ray. And shows Elliot the smile and says, even though they're technically not friends, he told his wife they were because she's embarrassed to say otherwise. He says him and his wife would get along. She ignores him too. Elliot says he didn't mean to be an asshole, and but he like he said before he's all good. And Ray says that he doesn't know why he's laughing. He thought he made some fake joke that he doesn't get. And I love that scene. Because there's so many people who just laugh for no reason. And the way they just kind of brought that up very subtly, I thought was very interesting. That's just something that Mr. Robot does so well. And I've said it before. You really need to intently listen to every conversation in the show. Because they're all trying to say something. And I, I think overall it's just really interesting. Ray says he's confused. He thought that they were on the same page. Elliot asks about what. Ray says when they spoke last night. And Elliot says he doesn't know what he's talking about. He didn't see him last night. Ray realized that he doesn't remember as many as he doesn't go okay. And this is where things get crazy. Elliot looks very startled, realizes this is one of his blackouts, runs back to his house and says to us that this was what the control of the regimen of the journal, his perfectly constructed loop has been about. So that way, nothing would interfere with it. Nothing would get in the way, you know, that he could continue this cycle and get away from Mr. Robot. And he looks in his journal, just frantically flipping through pages, not knowing what the hell is going on. And he sees part of it that says, going to sleep. And we basically get the sense that once he said that, Mr. Robot took over. And he says, last night through this morning while he was sleeping he can account for a gap in his consciousness and mr robot asks what did they say when they see him coming elliot says this is why he's different sometimes this mask takes over and elliot asks why they talked to him. mr robot says because he's going to make him realize that they see him and at this point i was like what 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 i literally said what like six times because i had no idea what was going on here and Elliot, this just shows how brilliant an actor Rami Malek is. He turns around, he starts hysterically laughing, and kind of maniacally as well. And Mr. Robot asks what's so funny. They start a moment, they're meant to lead it. Points a gun to his head. He says to get back on a terminal now. Elliot says to give him what he wants or keep shooting him and ask him where Tyrell is or shoot him again because the only one that's going to drive him mad is him, not Elliot. He's not going to make sure, he's going to make sure he doesn't do that. 
Now, let me talk about this theme for a second, because I don't think we're, again, I've said it before, don't take everything they say literally, honestly. Don't take everything they say literally. What Mr. Robot's trying to say is that sometimes Elliot shuts down. When he shuts down, the Mr. Robot persona comes out, and Elliot does things he doesn't remember, such as the 5-9 hack, such as, um him forgetting that Darlene was his sister, and such as whatever happened with Ray. I mean, we don't know what happened that night, and Mr. Robot knows, but Elliot doesn't, and it, again, it's it's becoming less of Elliot seeing Mr. Robot, and him and Mr. Robot very slowly, I think, becoming one, which, it's gonna be scary when that happens, but you know eventually you're gonna merge into one. I think this pretty much shows that Elliot's never gonna be able to get rid of Mr. Robots, and he's always gonna be somewhat a part of him. I think we definitely do see that here, and I really did like that. He goes to a journalist, and he's late for his church group, and such a well-done scene. Love the way that's done, but obviously that's not the end of the episode, and it's not the last thing we see with Elliot either. But then we get a very unexpected scene that I really did love, but really just very unexpected for this premiere. There are a lot of things that go into this scene. The fact that we see Gideon, and we know, of course, that uh, D. Piero is hunting Gideon and trying to get him to admit what he did and everything, and thinks that he's the one responsible for the 5-9 hack. But then there's also the fact that Gideon's by himself in this bar. We see, basically, there's this man, he sits down next to him, says that it was him, some stunt that everyone's laughing off of some dumb prank, but these guys knew what they were doing, and he never thought they had that hard cash would be this valuable now. And he says, he even says they're reliving Black Tuesday, the Great Depression, warning, and that we are, in fact, going in this direction that I thought we were going in, that the Great Depression has happened. This is the second Great Depression, and warning lights were flashing in the last two years. The Army Corps, the engineers, the Energy Department, State Department, and the Office of Personal Management were all hacked, and the government claimed that they were boosting security, but all that came of it was the same of 1929, which should hit the fan and act like this changes people, changes society. And Gideon's acting like it hasn't really changed him. He's kind of just going along with it. And Gideon says he's just having a drink, and the man says he knows he's rambling like a fanatic. As there's anything else he'd like to talk about, the beaches or espresso coffee. He says he's married, and, and this man, Brock, introduces himself. He says he knows who he is. He watches too much news. Gideon says he can't believe all the tabloid sensation. Brock says he's more of a diehard fan. Says he's got a smile. He's on a roll. He asks when he'd leave him, and Gideon asks if this was on the news too. And Brock says he can just tell by his face that that smile has left him. He's not, you know, the confident boss that he once was. We remember how confident Gideon was and how much, how powerful he was, things like that. But now he's just not. You know, he's he no longer has all safe, and he's kind of a broken soul. And Gideon asks it basically. A Brock says says it's obvious why they use him as a patsy. He gives us a very sympathetic, honest vibe, and he's the perfect vessel for their lies. And really, that's true. As we know, uh, Elliot framed him. Elliot framed Gideon for everything. Gideon says he'd agree with him, but he sure as hell feels like there's something bigger than him in their control, because he knows that he's obviously not the head of it. And he thanks Brock, and he asks for what. He says tomorrow he's going to be a hero. Gideon asks what he means. Brock says he may just be a patsy, but he's important. When in fact, he doesn't even think he's met a bigger crisis actor like him before. Says this is for their country. He shoots him in the neck, killing him, and Gideon's dead. And why do I think Brock did this? Because Brock felt he didn't serve a purpose anymore. You know, Gideon was a broken soul, and there was no fixing him. He lost everything. There was no reason to keep him alive. And I also think he kind of did this to protect F Society. I think that's the other reason why. He did this to protect F Society. He knows that Gideon has intel about F Society. He doesn't want Gideon spreading intel to Di Piero. And I'm pretty sure that Brock was, in fact, working with F Society. I'm pretty sure that's who he was. I mean, we've seen how large of a conglomerate F Society has become. And and I think Brock is definitely one of those members of the society that we've seen. He was set out to flirt with Gideon, pretend to be on Gideon's side, but they've now killed Gideon. I don't know what's going to happen there, but what's D. Piero going to do now? I don't really know, because D. Piero, obviously, as we know, was investigating intel about... Gideon and what was going on, and we don't know what he said to her, so I like that. I like the uncertainty there. I like that now Gideon's dead. I mean, it's one less character to follow, definitely, and one less character to care about, but honestly, I do think he served his purpose. I think Gideon served his purpose. I think this was a good ending to his character, and as sad as it was, I mean, it definitely does make sense. I mean, this is, like he said, the Great Depression. Acts like this happen. People get killed in bars, and just everyone's reaction to just seeing him getting killed was fantastic. Love the way that was done. Amazing stuff there. Sad to see Gideon 
can go, but I think a very fitting way to end his character. So Joanna then hears her baby crying, goes to check in on her, and knows to her, Tyrell's phone is ringing, and we don't know why. We don't really know what's going on there. And Elliot's in his church group, which is pretty relevant to what he's going through, which is kind of about power and how that can, what that can do to someone, and how everyone has something that they should be doing, such as Elliot with his hacking, which I thought was very interesting. But then we get to the end of this episode, which is so well done. I love the way this is done. Elliot then goes to a payphone that starts ringing. He gets a call. The man in the end, after it's really him, and realizes that it's Tyrell, who says, Bonsoir, Elliot, and that's the end of the episode, and hoo 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 Damn, I have missed this show. I mean, guys, this was such a good premiere. I loved everything about this premiere, but let's just get into it because there are so many things to get into. I think this episode actually gave me more questions than answers, and yes, now we know where Tyrell is, but the big question is what the hell happened that night? I mean, obviously, Elliot has no recollection. That was all Mr. Robot that did that. What he agreed to with Ray, what kind of terms are they on, what happened with Tyrell? Because it's clear that Mr. Robot knows. Mr. Robot ex knows exactly what happened to Tyrell, but he's not telling Elliot, and the reason, I think, is because he wants Elliot to find her on his own. He wants Elliot to suffer, and we, the audience as well, can't give him answers either, because we don't know what's going on. I like that we don't know what's going on. Again, I've said everything that happens in the show is intentional. There's a reason why there are certain things we know and there's certain things we don't know, which definitely I did like seeing that. Uh, so overall, that just is really interesting where that's going. You know, Ray, what is Ray's job exactly? What does he do? Definitely, I think Ray is involved with something similar to what Elliot is. He's not a hacker per se, but he's definitely involved with computers somehow, and I think definitely Elliot and him were working on something. I don't know what it is yet, and that's definitely going to be interesting to see what that is. Um, as far as the Great Depression, like the man said, like Brock said, the Great Depression has happened, and I don't think it's happened just yet. I think pretty much we're getting there because people are still rich, people are still powerful, and yes, the Great Depression, people are still rich, but there were a lot of people poor, and there's no one really poor right now. There's no one really dirt poor, and uh, I'm thinking it's going to happen at some point, and I think we're going to move in that direction as the season goes on, but right now the Great Depression hasn't yet happened. I think it definitely is going to happen, but it hasn't yet happened. I do like the way that F-Society is kind of manipulating people and kind of taunting them into joining their movement. I mean, it would make sense. F-Society right now is the most powerful corporation on the planet, pretty much. I mean, they single-handedly destroyed this bank, and they're going to they're go they're going out to destroy all these other banks, because again, I think to F-Society, money doesn't matter, because with money comes power, and people grow power-hungry, and they become more and more of an asshole. I mean, look what's happened to Angela. Angela is now in Evil Corp, and she pretty much is our villain this season. I will say that Angela seems like she's going in a villainous direction. Honestly, I'm really intrigued with this direction she's going. I never really would have thought that she'd go in this direction, but I think overall that's very interesting. I'm looking forward to seeing really what Angela's going to do, if she's going to become consumed with power, if she still has some sort of ounce of humanity in her, because she still has humanity in her, definitely, but she just feels that the best path forward, and I think we definitely do see that. I think that definitely is going to be very interesting what's going to happen there. Uh, D. Piero, what's D. Piero going to do now that Gideon's dead? I don't really know. Who set up Gideon's death is the big question. What's happening there? There's a lot of uncertainty with Darlene. We know Darlene obviously is a lot more powerful and she wants to control uh, F society, but we didn't see her at all in this episode. We saw her in the first part, but not in the second parts, and Again, to me, it just felt like one, it just felt more complete. That's the best way I can put it, is that this felt more complete than the first parts. Uh, but as far as Joanna, what is she going to do with Tyrell's phone? Obviously, he just gave her his phone, so what the hell is she going to do? Who was calling him as well? That's the big question, is who was calling Tyrell? Because we don't know who was actually calling him, so we don't really know what's going to happen with Joanna either. Again, I love the uncertainty. There's so much uncertainty going on with every character, and I, I really think overall it's just really interesting how much uncertainty is going on in the show. There's always uncertainty going on on. There's so many things that I don't know, and I love that. I love that there are so many things I don't know that's going on. There are so many things here. I mean, Scott, is Scott going to possibly give in to F Society? I could honestly see Scott leaving because of what he did. I mean, now he's kind of a wanted man, so we don't know what's going to happen there. Uh, Philip, has he actually appeased the government? Has he actually given in to them, or is he going to get the money? I mean, I think with Philip, he's going to do whatever he can to do what happens with that, and are they going to secure the Bloomberg TV gig? It seems like they want to to uh, use Bloomberg TV. I'm assuming to get money because they're slowly losing money. I think they're just kind of desperate right now, Evil Corp, because they're definitely losing money. You definitely do see that. 
But overall, guys, I know you guys saw this premiere. I am so happy the show is back. I am so ready for the rest of the season. I mean, this was such a good premiere between everything we got in the first part and the second part. It just, it was such a good decision to make this episode two hours. I love the way it was done. But let me know what you guys saw this episode. Love to hear your thoughts on it. And we'll see you guys in my next video, which will be for a classic movie review. And I will see you guys for that. Okay, bye.